أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد نبيه ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم which means in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah and Allah alone. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his last divinely sent messenger and the seal of the prophethood. Amin. Brothers and sisters, friends, we want to welcome everyone our friends and guests in South Africa, the United States, and around the world, to this week's edition of A Conversation with El Hajj Mori Salah Khan. I am pleased to be your host, coming to you once again through the Salaam Media platform out of Johannesburg, South Africa. Salaam Media is an online portal for humanitarian journalism. We don't just report the news, we advise you on what you can do about it. Our topic for today is after the elections, what comes next? Part two. Uh, we are pleased to have uh, uh, two very impressive sisters with us today, inshallah, uh, who among other things happen to be political activists. Now, before I introduce them, there is a piece of uh, a very important video I'd like for us all to see and uh, reflect deeply upon. This is a reality check. It made for great TV and clickbait, but there was never gonna be a fascist takeover of America's cities. There was a, an attempted coup, but it was mainly just embarrassing. It would take somebody actually clever to orchestrate something like what Adolf did. Trump and his sycophants can't even keep their stories straight for an hour. His campaign's always been a clown car wreck. And if they weren't stealing so much of our money and wreaking so much chaos, it would be really funny. But we know about all that. The big story here is why so many people would gobble up any excuse to throw themselves behind so obvious a fake macho man. But that's what 70 million people did because white America is having an identity crisis. And as it turns out, when your identity is based on fiction, you will defend that fiction as if your life depended on it. A nation with a false history, told that they're the greatest people on earth, feeling humiliated by reality, are going to follow anybody, no matter how ridiculous, if they're promised revenge. And in the end, they're gonna destroy themselves in the process, whether their hero is Mussolini, or that pharaoh who chased Moses, or a reality show host. But to let the Trumpites off the hook a little bit, our public square is now privately owned, for sale to the highest bidders, which is the inevitable result of the business model of our nation having always been at cross-purposes with the business of being human. Marketing campaigns work, and Make America Great Again took those who fell for it mostly by regional misfortune, back to that mythic American origin story of righteous might and moral authority. In reality, the America they've been trying to dial us back to is 1692 Salem, when the colonies were just the little playthings of their English lords, and the colonists' demented version of Christianity gave them night terrors about everything outside the settlement walls. When First Nation natives and Africans weren't human, when women were property, when justice meant burning witches, and science was seeing if they float first. That is how stupefying it is to imagine that the AT&T owned CNN, which makes $200 billion a year in corporate advertising, and Joe Iraq oil war Biden belong in the same sentence as socialism. Socialism is a word that's been turned into a Pavlovian response trigger to make people quiver in fear about the quality of life in Japan, the UK, Israel, Canada. Socialism is simply the belief that a society should regulate its institutions rather than allow private tyrannies to oppress the peasant class. The same fundamental principle as a democracy or a republic. All of these words refer to a government run by the people. None of them applies to CNN, and barely any of them apply to this country. 
Let's make this even simpler. Either kings and feudal lords rule the people or the other way around. Those are our two choices, and it doesn't matter what we call it. What matters is that we face the truth. And what's happening right now is our karma for not dealing with our cultural monstrosity sooner. White America is having a psychotic break that has been a long time coming. The majority of white people voted for a reality show host to save them. That says it all. Democracy was saved by the majority of black women and men and people of color and a minority of whites. White people have like one more shot to redeem themselves before the natural demographic shifts in the country just do it for us. We have to get our origin story straight and face our childhood trauma. And until we do, we're going to have a collective mental health crisis. So one more time for the people in the back. We are a nation founded by extremists who lied and killed and stole this land, who refused to outlaw slavery as part of our Declaration for Independence, and whose self-rule was only for white aristocrats who owned land and believed that they had a God-given right to it and nobody else did. Now, regardless of the myths, that is not what Jesus believed. After the Civil War over slavery, white America enabled the Confederacy to rise to power again, rather than uplifting and embracing the black women and men who helped build their empire. In the 1930s, white America didn't want to let in the Jews fleeing the Holocaust. National hero Charles Lindbergh wanted America to form a neutrality pact with Hitler. The airwaves were filled with Nazi sympathizers. In the 60s, whites didn't want to sit in the same part of the bus, or the same classrooms, or even restaurants as the descendants of slaves. White people were appalled at the protests threatening the good order of our caste system. Martin Luther King diagnosed the illness of the white moderate, who paternalistically believes that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who praises incremental change and compromise and unity with white nationalists. Dr. King protested, saying the time is always ripe to do right. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Those were his words, and the country killed him, and Jack and Bobby Kennedy, and Malcolm X, and countless others, for daring to challenge our extremism, which continued. White America elected Nixon, and then Reagan, and then Clinton, who militarized police forces and incarcerated black and brown people and poor people at rates never seen in the history of the world. In the 2000s, white supremacy found a new way to shock and awe. They invaded a country that was no threat to us, with the rallying cry, support the troops, as if it was the troops' idea. They killed 100,000 people for empire building, just like they've always done. And most of America gave it a pass, because it was an Arab nation and it seemed far away, and the way we like our media is for entertainment purposes only. And the bipartisan war criminals and bank fraudsters and oil spillers and plunderers of the world, they hugged and took selfies in the name of what Dr. King called the white moderate's devotion to their sense of order over justice. But the majority of whites were so triggered by a black president and the dawning reality that the feudal lords really don't care about the peasant class, they elected Trump, an infamous racist rich kid grifter, in the hopes that he might protect them. This guy was famous for stiffing people who worked for him. And his celebrity crime family brings our fragile order into chaos, and some people are surprised. There's a virus killing 2,000 people a day. And we know how to stop it, but we're not, because we're still arguing with reality. So those who think there was ever a normal that we should go back to are in the deep end of our collective identity crisis. We want to go back to normal as just the PC way of saying, make America great again. President Biden speaks with a civility and a warmth that is a great relief. He also voted for and promoted that oil war as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in Congress and on the talk show circuit. One of the first people that he's delegated to handle our life-threatening climate crisis is a top recipient of fossil fuel money, a former consultant to the notorious cancer and birth defect-causing DuPont company. This guy has such a horrific environmental record, the actual Aaron Brockovich just penned an editorial in The Guardian entitled, Dear Joe Biden, Are You Kidding Me? And of course he's not kidding. 
And of course, all Biden's cabinet picks are being gushed over by the corporate media, which Republicans are rightfully disgusted by. But their solution to aristocracy is monarchy, because they're even more attached to 17th century European caste systems than the left. But the truth is, all these guys are eating from the same trough. Big banks, insurance, big oil, big auto, pharmaceuticals. That club doesn't fight to stop the abuses of their own membership. Almost every president we've ever had wanted one thing more than anything else. To get into that club and stay in it. And that club doesn't include you and me. And that's why income, education, and healthcare inequality are at unsustainable levels. It's why our criminal justice system is still a human rights catastrophe and why we've barely begun dealing with the climate crisis and our politics are a national joke. We do not need any more of the right or the left sides of the white aristocracy to unite. We need to face our childhood trauma and grow up. Every lawyer who is engaged in this frivolous, vexatious litigation to suppress the votes of black and brown people should be disbarred. This disinformation campaign that's killing 2,000 Americans a day, it shouldn't be censured on social media. It should be prosecuted. Snake oil senators stealing our tax dollars for their paymasters during a global emergency should be prosecuted because stealing is wrong. The rule of law demands no pardons for these delinquents that briefly occupied our White House. We can have mercy, but this is a reality check. The words far left are being used to describe U.S. domestic policy 80 years ago and services every developed nation delivers now. We have to upgrade our institutions that are 200 years out of date if we hope to survive the century. Now, the Trumpites, they love to pretend they're protecting the roots of Western society, but even a tree knows that its purpose is to keep growing. I mean, these people, they're the barbarian hordes that burned Rome to the ground. The tiki torch wavers, they had a chant. They said, you will not replace us. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. We can heal, but only if we admit we started this whole thing broken. White America, it's time to join the 21st century. Suck it up and put a mask on. And before you start thinking we're going to split off into a blue country and a red one, no, we're not greenlighting more pollution or another arms race or founding another new white terrorist nation. Dr. King said either we go up together or we go down together. This culture of every man for himself and winner take all, that's got to go the way of the savages that we evolved from. You remember, we used to call them the pilgrims. The path forward has been laid out for thousands of years. Your favorite book, it says it like this. You can't make money and power your master and work toward the highest good at the same time. You got to pick one. Well, this time it's now or never. That's the challenge of our generation. And we're up for it. We were made for this. But it's going to take all our strength. In the days to come, we have to demonstrate the human values that belong to an advanced society. As long as there's a war in ourselves, there will be war in the world. So may you be in a state of peace and clarity. May you know who you are. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, friends of uh, Salam Media, uh, uh, Brother Al-Hajj Maurice Salah Khan, the Afia Foundation, I want to apologize. Um, I asked the engineer to stop the uh, the broadcast of that video because for what, for some reason the sound quality is absolutely terrible. And you know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said you know Allah has prescribed proficiency in all things. So whatever you do, do it well. Um, the sound quality is 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 just terrible and. Uh, it's, and thus, it's taken away, distracting from the message, the very important message that uh, uh, we should, uh, I wanted my viewers to get from uh, the video. So we, we stopped it. Um, I have shown that video on my Facebook page. Inshallah ta'ala, we will re-air it again. Um, the, uh, uh, the sisters, my guests that will be with me today, uh, they have seen the video and I'm going to ask them uh, to comment on the message uh, that uh, they were able to get from a, you know, uh, a clean uh, sounding uh, 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 a copy of that, uh, that very important message. So 
without any further ado, I just want to go on and uh, uh, just uh, interview my guests and get on with the conversation, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, my first guest, and, and I'm going to provide an abbreviated introduction uh, of uh, a couple of very impressive resumes. Nadia B. Ahmed is an associate professor at Barry University School of Law, uh, the coordinator of the Environmental and Earth Law Certificate Program and a published expert in that field. In 2020, she was appointed to the Council of the ABA, the American Bar Association Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, the advisory board of the ABA Center for the Human Rights Dignity Rights Initiative and the Florida Bar Journal slash News Editorial Board. Uh, she is the co-founder and chair of Muslim Delegates and Allies Coalition and the co-director of Immigrants, Immigrants uh, Rights for Biden. Uh, she was recognized in 2016 by the Orlando Business Journal as a 40 under 40 honoree for her leadership and community involvement. Hania Jodad Barnes is a businesswoman, a philanthropist, entrepreneur, a published author, and a former Bernie DNC delegate, DNC Democratic National Convention. She has worked as an award-winning face-to-face -face fundraising coordinator for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, for the USA and Australia. She is a founding member of the Women's March Los Angeles, I should say of Women's March Los Angeles, and a former board member of WMLA and Women's March California. She served on the planning committee for the families Belong Together Los Angeles March, uh, the March for Our Lives, as well as the International Women's Strike. For years now, much of her focus has been on voter education and voter registration. Her activism work has won accolades from the City of Los Angeles, the Board of Los Angeles County Supervisors, and the City of West Hollywood. Hania is the co-director of Immigrants, and Muslims for Biden 50 state voter mobilization and she is co-founder and president of Muslim delegates and allies. Without any further ado, let me welcome both of our sisters to this week's edition of a conversation with Al-Hajj Maurice Salah Khan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having us. Good to have both of you with us. The video message that unfortunately the audience wasn't able to see because the, uh, the, the, the sound quality was very poor. You, you both received that video. Did you, uh, did you watch it in its ele entire 11 minute uh, entirety? And uh, if you did, what are your thoughts on the issues raised uh, by that uh, thought provoking commentator? Who wants to go first? Do, okay, I'll go, Nadia. Um, thank you, uh, Brother Salah Khan, for allowing us the space uh, to be here today. And uh, I just want to uh, touch upon one thing that is very important that, that was brought up in the video is that, you know, if we think that prior to Trump's presidency and rise of white supremacy, if uh, racism or if everything was fine in America, it's a facade. You know, it wasn't. Uh, but we know for a fact that. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, white voters uh, propelled um, Trump to presidency in 2016 by 54% voting for him, right? And when we see the numbers now, we see that nothing changed much by just 1% uh, added to the 56%. So 57% in 2020 voted for Trump, while 42% um, voted for Biden. So, um, you know, and, and, and again, we're talking about a country that was built and founded on the, the on the backs of slaves as well as the indigenous people, right? So um, I don't want to say we have them to thank uh, for for Trump, but uh, I would have to say they play a very big role in in, in unfortunately the rise of of uh, white supremacy in this country. Um, and I'll have Nadia add to that also, but that's what I got out of the video. 
Yes, and I would also add in that with respect to the video, what I what I found was, especially if you couldn't even hear the audio quality, it was really even the, the video itself, is that much of what we have been saying all along is being said by a white man. And so I think that was something that was really effective. I think that when I say something, it's it's taken, even if I see other, another person says the exact same thing, I think who the speaker is matters from a rhetoric uh, standpoint. So many of the, the facts in terms of the information that was being provided was important, uh, but what I found to be really, uh, what really struck me was that when you had a white man saying those things, it would resonate more with a broader, broader audience. Mm -hmm. Now, my sisters, your thoughts on where the country is right now vis-a-vis -vis the elections. The fact that Trump has not yet conceded defeat. In fact, I was watching some of the uh, uh, the Sunday morning talk shows, and it was shocking, really, especially when I tuned in to uh, Fox News to hear the president of the United States still calling into question the legitimacy of the elections and making... I mean, some really outrageous claims and, and making it very, very clear that he and his uh, uh, army of attorneys have, are not yet finished in trying to undo the will of the people uh, and in the process really doing a tremendous disservice uh, to what is supposed to be a democratic process in this country. Um, what are your thoughts on where we are right now as a country? Let's go back to you, uh, 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 my sister, uh, Nadia, I'm sorry. So what I, what I would, what I would want to add is that what, one of the, one of the issues that we've really been plagued by is that Donald Trump was a new phenomenon. This, the, yeah. the, ry the rise of, of white supremacy was a new phenomenon. Yeah. And I think that that's a narrative that as Muslim Americans, we have to push back against is that the racism that has existed was part of the founding of our of our country. And that's something that the video I think also brought home very, very clearly is that we are, have to provide a counter narrative to what, what is happening. And what I also see is, is really uh, troubling going forward is that we're seeing a continuation of existing US, US administrations. And so even if you look at the Donald, Donald Trump's administration, you won't see you won't see in terms of policy level a vast distinction between him, uh, President Obama, and President Bush, especially for, for us as, as Muslim Americans and as people of color, we haven't seen this this we haven't seen the the veil of Islamophobia be lifted and, and be gone. It, it's been there and it's really uh, been become much worse. In fact, what Donald Trump really did was make it okay to be racist, is that everyone who had been racist um, and who was hiding under rocks and crags since the 1960s, they were all of a sudden able to, to crawl out of that. Um, and so that's really what I think is unique about the Trump, uh, the, the, the rise of Trump, is that that's something that's new. And what he's doing right now is just sowing chaos. He's sowing chaos and not accepting the results of a legitimate and free and fair elections. I think the description of, of sowing chaos chaos is a very uh, apt one. Uh, Sister Hania, your thoughts? Well, I mean, I uh, again, just uh, kind of piggybacking off of what Nadia said, the rise of Trump wasn't something that, again, we, we can't... Uh, he didn't give birth to uh, white supremacy. Again, this has been something that has been embedded in the fabric of this country uh, for, for decades. Um, but I also think that the Republican Party also had a huge hand in enabling this man to get away with um, really murder without any, um, uh, you know, putting him on stand to even ask him any questions about his actions or behavior or even slapping him on the wrist to say enough is enough, right? So I do also blame as much as I do. I do have to say that, you know, again, the, the Democratic Party did not listen to that part of America that was in need of healthcare, that was in need of a, 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 a minimum wage paid 
job. They were they didn't listen to uh, people losing their jobs and losing their their businesses to say, for example, overseas to Mexico and China. They didn't listen to that crowd. Therefore, you know, the the people that were unheard by the Democratic Party were the ones who gave us Trump, right? And the the Republican Party played a big part on that message, and they ran with it. Right, so I I would say um, again, uh, he's he's an uh, unstable narcissist, and we've seen what that does in in, in history uh, to countries and to people. And I really hope that the Republican Party stands up and says enough is enough, and they have a peaceful transition uh, of power so that we can begin healing. But um, we'll see. Henry, what are your thoughts on the president elect's picks thus far? <laughs> well, um, I, I will say this, uh, Maury, uh, that unfortunately COVID-19 exposed um, the flaws in this country. It wasn't just Trump, but I also think that this pandemic gave um, us a, a clear understanding as to how damaged the foundation of this country truly is, right? And COVID only exposed the dire need to invest in social programs and 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 um, uh, building the back in the communities of color, right? Because those are the ones that are the the frontline workers working jobs that most people don't, right? And so they're the ones exposed to COVID with literally having zero uh, uh, funding or money or healthcare to even take care of their families, right? So I I think that for Biden, I would say you know, his cabinet needs to lead with diplomacy, kindness, and really listen to the cries of, of the middle class to, to uh, uh, people who live under poverty in this country, right? And I think that uh, I would, what, what I would say is that he has to, I mean, I, I have my feelings about the cabinet, uh, especially people who have voted for wars um, previously. And I would say that if we don't, cut the funds and if you don't bring the, the, you know the money back home and invest in our social programs we're going to have a huge issue right uh moving forward so uh <laughs> my I, I have my feelings about the cabinet but i would say that in order for biden to succeed he has to be very careful about who he puts in position of power so that we don't go back to another trump and, i agree uh, i i i wholeheartedly agree and and uh nadia on that kind of connected to that same question right now there's a bit of infighting taking place within the democratic party around the issue the issue of picks uh for administration posts as well as um you know uh, clearly identifying what the priorities should be going forward what are your thoughts on, you know, where things are right now within the Democratic Party itself? So Hania and I were both uh, delegates uh, to the DNC for Bernie Sanders. And so being a Bernie Sanders delegate and also working on the uh, election, primary election for Bernie Sanders, it was the first time I felt I was a part of this country where I had a political leader who spoke to me and not at me and who included me as a part of the conversation. So that was a big shift from previous years of political organizing for me and many other organizers. And I and I think what it also did is it gave us the imagination to think about what would what would a world would look like if the government actually listened to the people, the will of the people. And you know, I think you had asked, you know, also about, you know, what how do you feel about the picks that have been made so far with respect to the cabinet? The, the, that's really like what we're seeing right now is uh, picks that are being uh, shown to be, you know, uh, moderate centrist uh, Democrats who also have been aligned previously with, uh, with, with war and empire building. So that's disconcerting to, to us, you know, as the progressive left. But at the same time, I think that we should also be able to peel away and see the victories that we've had in this election. And one of those big victories 
is a, 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 a movement away from corporate money. So now is, uh, what you've seen happening, especially during some of the primary elections, they were tight because the, there was this renunciation among the Democratic Party at multiple levels that we didn't want to have special interest money, whether it's from fossil fuels or, or other types of large corporate donors. And so I think that's a positive outcome that we have uh, with this election. And what you see also is that this move right that you had with Donald Trump, it's also created a pendulum to the fur further left as well, where you have uh, candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and Ayanna Presley emerging. And so the squad is now doubled now. And so I think going forward that you're going to see more people who, who see people like themselves represented in Congress. interesting thought. Um, one of the things that on that point that you just made, uh, Nadia, uh, that uh, I find very intriguing is while there was uh, finger pointing after the elections within the Democratic Party uh, because of a number of seats that were lost, congressional seats, uh, and there, were, there was finger pointing with, you know, uh, some of the centrists wanting to blame the progressives. The reality is that the, uh, the progressive base expanded. It actually grew. And, and I believe that if uh, a very objective analysis is done on the campaign that just, uh, well, I would say almost ended because of the shenanigans of Trump that are still going on, uh one would have to 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 conclude that biden won because of the energy of the progressive wing of the party which includes african americans and uh, Lat latinos and in in very uh, key battleground states uh, the muslim vote in key battleground states uh, but that was more along the lines of the progressive wing of the party well your your thoughts on that um, Tanya? Well, you're absolutely right um, in that um, we see this also, this message in Georgia also that um, some centrists say if uh, the, the candidates are not more to, um, you know, appeal to the centrist Democrats that they are going to lose the Georgia um, elections and we're going to lose Senate fully. And I have to say that it is the progressives who are now phone banking and um, uprising from, from a grassroots standpoint to, to build power um, from California, Florida. I mean, I can talk about, about an initiative that we're running right now, uh, the phone banks that we've been running for the past two weeks with over 100 volunteers um, and over 50 people who show up to um, a phone bank for the state of Georgia for both John Ossoff and uh, uh, Reverend Warnock. And that is led by two progressive women who were Bernie Sanders delegates. Um, um, it, we what what the the Democratic Party has to understand is that we are not the the generation of 2016 to where we're easily fooled. We are not the generation of Bush. We are not the generation of Obama anymore. Uh, being married to a black man, my son. Um, the other day, you know, pointed at the TV with his father standing there next to him and said, Obama on CNN, right? And I thought to myself, as, as historic as this was for a lot of people, it still didn't speak to the black and brown communities, uh, his mm -hmm. president, right? Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, he did do some good, um, but I, it, it, it wasn't good enough for what we need in this country to be able to be really the biggest power in the world, right? Um, and, I, and I have to say, it is the progressives who are giving that um, opportunity for us to be the nation that leads with diplomacy and grace, right? It is us who talk about, let's bring the funds from military, the $740 billion Pentagon budget, let's reinvest that in social programs for our black and brown communities. 
It is us who talk about Medicare for all, universal health care, which is now deemed a socialist movement in this country in order to create fear, right? To think that we're going to go back to, you know, we're going to live like, say, you know, Russians do or Cubans did or so on and so forth. Um, you know, but but seldom people talk about, well, why aren't, you know, people who, who, who uh, that 1% doesn't pay their fair share of taxes? It's the progressives who talk about issues like that, right? So although, you know, the Democratic Party wishes that we were gone, I always tell Nadia, I say, I feel like we, because us as Muslim women in particular, because we were never given the tools to really build the table, we bring our broken folding chairs and we really open it up on top of the table, right? And here we are right running initiatives uplifting mobilizing and we are the progressives who do that and we are the progressives who again going back to the cabinet picks will continue to talk about uh you know banning fracking we will continue to talk about um you know cutting the military budget so we can bring that back home uh, so black and brown communities can get the education and thrive get the uh, housing that they need to to be able to rest their head without you know being homeless so um you know we uh, we're here and then we're going to continue to grow as a movement. So I'd say the Democrats need to really get with it. I want to put a question to both of you uh, that I put to a couple of uh, very, uh, a couple of well-known and respected brothers, uh, political activists um, in their own right, and brothers, both of whom, well, one is still in the state Senate and the other has retired from uh, his duties in the House of Representatives, and he has been uh, uh, deeply involved for a number of years as a leading ac uh, activist force in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, a, few, a few weeks back, we had two, th these two brothers with us for a conversation on the same platform. Um, one is Prince George's County, Maryland, Muslim Council President. Uh, Brother Jamil Johnson. Uh, he's a former chief of staff for Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York. And, and the other brother was Iowa State Senator Akeo Abdul Samad. Um, I want to put a couple of questions to you that I put to them uh, when they were with us a few weeks back. Uh, the first question Muslims were absent from the main platforms of both conventions this past summer. Not surprised, this was not surprising for the Republican Party, but I'm sure it was a big letdown for Muslims in the Democratic Party. I would like to have your thoughts on that. That's the first question. And then the second, what do you say to those who have opted out of this political process? I'm talking about Muslims now, as well as uh, non-Muslims from you know, some of the hard hit marginalized uh, constituencies in this political pot called America. Uh, those Muslims, as, as, as it pertains to them, who argue that it's haram or forbidden to be involved in such a system and, you know, have just opted out. What, what, what are your thoughts on these two questions? Uh, let, let me begin with you, uh, Nadia. Yeah, so I think I think what we need to look at is see not only were we absent from the larger Democratic, uh, like the DNC platform on the main stage, but then we need to also look at and see who was actually okay. present. And so one of one of the people who was present there was a former New York mayor and former um, uh, presidential mm -hmm. candidate Michael Bloomberg and he had spent in excess of a hundred million dollars in campaign ads and to, to help his uh, campaign and he had lost handily in the primaries and still he was being brought back up on the stage and so I think that he was really the face of trying to show pushback against the divisiveness of Donald Trump's uh, 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 bigotry as well and I think that um, you know if we look also closely at Michael Bloomberg Bloomberg's policies while he was mayor of New York. He did a lot of uh, surveillance of Muslim communities. He also had the stop and frisk policy that he had no, uh, no qualms with later on when he was asked recently this year about it. And so when that's the person that's brought to the DNC stage, 
it's it's a slap in the face to Muslim Americans as well as African Americans. And these were the constituencies that delivered key votes for Joe Biden. Um, and so the problem is, is that the Democratic Party takes both of these constituencies, even to the extent they overlap, uh, for granted. And that's something I think that unless we're involved with politically, that's something that is not going to, to be able to change. If we, uh, there's many times I don't feel included or welcomed in, 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 in the circles of the Democratic Party, but I don't think that's dissuaded me from getting involved because I know if I'm not there, it's it's that my 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 silence will be there and I don't want that to be there. I think it's important for us to speak up and speak up for ourselves. Well said. Hania. Um, I have to say that um, uh, during the presidential elections, Nadia, myself, and, and uh, our brother Ali bin Zahid uh, led an initiative through 50 state voter mobilization to flip three counties that have been red for decades blue uh, in Florida. And as Nadia mentioned, $100 million by Bloomberg was invested um, there to flip the county, so uh, flip the uh, state. Um, and it didn't work really, right? Um, and I have to say that unless the Democratic Party reaches out to the most marginalized communities, our Latinx community, Muslim community, and African American community, we're going to get the same results over and over and over. Yes, we do have uh, our first historic uh, female Black vice president right now, but does that really speak to the working class Black women in this country that are working two, three jobs to put a roof over their head and feed their children? Right? Does that provide them healthcare free? And if it does provide them healthcare free, do they get the same treatments when they go to hospitals as white women do? Right? Eh, chances are no. So, um, if the Democratic Party continues to dismiss our voices, uh, they're going to continue to, uh, again, to lose to the next Trump. Because again, we always talk about this, and I want to take it back to the rise of Trump. This wasn't, uh, you know, Trump isn't the only racist uh, supremacist that has been a president. There has been many. He was just very upfront about it. And so um, I do have to say it was disappointing not to see faces that represented us, especially as Bernie Sanders delegates. We were very, uh, coming from California, being one of the largest delegations in the nation, it was a slap in the face. But I have to say it doesn't, we're going to continue to do the work. And to your second question, it's very important, um, I think, for me to answer is that if the Muslim community continues to sit out of politics, what that means is that some other person probably and most likely a white man who is going to make a decision on the lives of Iraqis, Afghans, people in Yemen, Palestinians, right? People in Kashmir. If we are not, and if we don't stand up and say enough is enough, and we're, we're going to become you know, religious aside, you have to also lead with common sense too, right? We need to be the ones who get engaged, get involved, mobilize, and build on a grassroots level and build partnership with communities that we, the Muslim community often doesn't or, or, or doesn't reach out to, like our LGBTQ community, right? We have to start doing that as Muslims. We have to be able to make decisions, but be a part of the conversation. And if we continue to sit out because it's haram, then how can we have a say-so in what happens in Yemen? How can we have a say-so in what happens in Palestine? That's impossible without our voices. So I would encourage for all of our brothers and sisters to kind of roll up their sleeves and um, take action. Well said. Um, what's happening within your respective circles? Now you, you I was able to uh, get a pretty good sense of the kind of activism uh, you sisters and your partners were involved in uh, in the lead up to the November 3rd elections. And I found it very impressive, alhamdulillah. Um, what's happening in your circles now to prepare for the positive pressure that, need, that will need to be brought to bear on the Biden-Harris administration in order to usher in some long overdue positive change. What's happening now? Because there are things, you know, 
I think on one hand, there's, uh, there's an effort being made, not just outside the Democratic Party, but within the Democratic Party to try to tap down on the expectation of this incoming administration, to tap down on expectations, uh, to making the argument that uh, he will not have the kind of margins he needs, even if uh, those two seats are won by the Democratic Party uh, in Georgia, um, is going to be the need for, you know, uh, uh, for, for all of the Democrats to vote in sync on major issues and then for, uh, if necessary, the vice president to be the tiebreaker um, in the Senate. So again, there's an effort being made to kind of push back on expect, don't, don't have too high an expectation. I heard, and I wish I had that quote in front of me, I wish I had brought that with me for this conversation. Very insightful uh, uh, young African-American lawyer, a, a female, who made the argument in an interview that there are things that Biden will be able to do um, without the need for a vote uh, in favor of such and such policy from the Senate uh, or even from the House. There are things that he will be able to do uh, without that requirement that he's going to need to be pushed to do. We are going to need to uh, uh, exert pressure on him to do the things that he is able to do with the executive authority that he will have. What are your thoughts on that? And, and what are some of the things uh, uh, that, that come to mind for you that he would be able to do uh, once he comes into office without the need of the you know, consent powers of uh, uh, the House or Senate, or in particular the Senate? So what I would what I would say is that we have to look and see what has been happening in this country for the past few decades is that there has been no legislation being coming out of Congress. We have a series of executive orders, and I think that's fundamentally weakened uh, our democracy, where we don't, where we have Congress, uh, you know, two chambers of Congress, and they can't come to a decision, uh, especially to impact the well-being of the quality of life of everyday Americans. What I also see happening is that the last piece of major legislation that you saw was the Affordable yeah. Care Act that was passed. There, in, in terms of environmental regulations, there's been no major environmental regulations for over 50 years. And there has to be a, a mindset to have legislation, not just pass a series of executive orders. And that's, and that's what I think really corrodes our democracy. And so, in terms of you know what we're saying in our inner circles, we're also looking back and saying that there's a lot of election fatigue that that uh, that that individuals are going through, um, and there's a lot of people that also think that you know we've accomplished what we needed to do, and now we could just sit back for another two four years until the next election cycle comes around. But you know what Hania and I have have you know realized is that this is actually the time where we have to step up and put more pressure on so if we worked hard during the general election and the primaries now is where we're actually going to have to do the work in terms of putting pressure on our elected officials and seeing that the young people are really the the key in future to to this uh, one of the things that martin luther uh jr martin luther king jr had said is that um, if we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over all America and all over the world when justice rolls down like waters and righteous like a mighty stream. And so if that's really the, 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 this, the future that we can envision for ourselves, it's not going to happen by those of us just standing around and waiting for change to happen. We have to go out there and do it ourselves. Like don't look to see what, don't, don't look to other people to lead, but make, make it something that you want to learn and figure out on your own. Okay, Hania. 
Well, I want to thank you, Brother Mori, for being um, uh, so incredible enough to participate in some of the uh, initiatives that we were running, um, because I think all of us shared one mutual uh, uh, ideology is that we all hated Trump, so we wanted him out of the White House, right? So I think that really brought all of us together from all parts of life, right? So, uh, but um, I would have to say that the Biden administration, we just kind of piggybacking off of what Nadia says, is is what the Biden administration can do right now, really, uh, with the with the push and the pressure of uh, the progressives and the Democrats is make sure they pass a stimulus package for people, right? And I'm not even talking about long-term, uh, you know, defunding the police. And here, those are all ideas that we're working towards, right, um, as the progressive left. But I think looking at the, the, the situation that we're in as a country, there has to be, there has to be some sort of a, um, uh, protection, there's some sort of uh, a relief package that's passed for people that are literally losing their, their homes because they can't pay their bills, right? So um, I do have to say, and again, going back to what I was saying at the very beginning, um, is that we as, as Muslim delegates and allies have and will continue to work on uh, legislation and policies that, um, you know, address uh, the issue of war, addresses the issue of ending, uh, you know, the, the endless wars in, in the Middle East and, uh, you know, uh, some parts of South Asia, as well as, uh, you know, we will continue to work on, um, uh, you know, writing platforms and, and suggesting platforms that do care about what Muslim community goes through here in this country, including surveillances and, and uh, you know, things that we've been suffering from for, for a long time. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that would be my... Oh. And I would also add that I think it's imperative for us to see like how this democratic process has evolved over time. And I think that the more and more young people get involved, the more that they can have a chance to change uh, the, the democratic outcomes that we are seeing. And what I think we can also see happening as well is that, um, is that you know, there's, this is really like where in that when um, these wars were being fought uh, in uh, in Muslim countries, the idea was that these wars are being fought for democracy. And that could probably be nothing further from the truth in terms of that happening. Um, and I think we can also see is that there's uh, quite, a, qu quite a bit of issues that have been occurring over time. And how those issues have changed are, are, are going to, um, to, to really uh, be impactful.
I don't know. Okay, I'm back. Where's my guest? Subhanallah. I mean, I'm so sorry, sisters. I don't know what happened. This is a this this is a first uh, for me to have been interrupted like this on on this platform. Uh, but mashallah, you know, we. I, I hope the two of you were talking to each other and 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 the audience, but. Uh, uh we are unfortunately just a few minutes away from the end of this broadcast so and 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 there is a, a a special there's a statement that i want to make at the very end uh pertaining to one of the issues raised in that uh, video that we attempted to play this this broadcast has been a a broadcast of challenges um where the commentator stated that we have to get our origin story straight. And so there's a very important statement I want to make at the end of this broadcast. Uh, what I'd like to do um, before uh, going there is to invite both of you sisters to share a closing thought, um, a, a final thought on, on what comes next now from your humble perspective from your activist orientation what comes next what should come next from your perspective this will be your your final thought let's let's begin with you uh, hania um well i do have to say i have been a bit concerned with some of our muslim community members who have been celebrating nonstop the election of biden uh, harris uh, uh, as, as, as president and our future vice president. And I have to say that um, as a Muslim community, we must continue to stay, enga stay engaged and challenge policies that directly and indirectly um, impact our communities. And I would have to say that my message would be for our younger boys and girls to also get involved, get engaged, and run for office, and uh, you know, uh, begin working on policies that for the betterment of the Muslim community here and abroad. And I would say that um, getting lazy now and sitting back because we had one victory and uh, in 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 in, in uh, pushing Trump's administration out of the office, um, it doesn't really help the situation because, again, our problems didn't rise with Trump and they won't end after Trump. So we have to continue uh, to take uh, uh, take up and uh, occupy spaces that we were once told that we don't belong in. Um, I'll pass it to you, Nadia, but I, that would be my encouragement for our community and uh, for communities of color in general is the more we get active, the more we get engaged in politics, the, more, the better our chances at, at being successful at things we want to see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes, um, Hania. What I would actually, uh, you know, uh, share some of the words uh, from, you know, uh, Brother El Hajj Mori Salahan, where he had made recommendations to Muslims in America. Um, you know, he, he had written about, you know, what kind of world could the future bring? And he had written this, you know, back after 9 11. And I think. What he had just said and what you've just said really, uh, you know, bring back that same point is that I think that we have to work to educate non-Muslims about our communities. I think that needs to really be at the forefront of bring, building progressive coalitions among uh, Christians, Jews, and others, uh, and really build around issues that are common uh, to, to us. And I think also another thing that you touched upon is that um, you know, there's a number of prominent Muslims as well as prominent Muslim organizations that really have to remove the legit, like the cloak of legitimacy within the Muslim American community about the government's war on terrorism, is that we cannot put a rubber stamp on the government's uh, war on terrorism. And I think that's something that really has to be at the forefront of this struggle, is that we have to resist it uh, in every way that we can, is that we have to really, you know, have the strength of mind and spirit to call out um, the, these issues. Thank you very much, my sisters. This has been a broadcast of challenges, but 
It has been very delightful. Inshallah ta'ala, we are going to have both of you back in the very near future. I want to thank you on behalf of the Salaam Media Audience International. Uh, this uh, broadcast is going to be shared far and wide after the fact. And with that, I, uh, I greet you uh, as uh, I did in the beginning uh, with, uh, again, a note of thanks. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. And to my Salaam media audience, both in South Africa and here um, in the US and around the world, I wanna, I wanna end with something very, very, very important. We just celebrated, those of us who did, um, another year of, of contradictions uh, as it pertains to the holiday known as Thanksgiving. I think it's very appropriate for us uh, to reveal, or I should say review, a very, very important part of uh, the history behind this uh, this celebration so that uh, we can be more empathetic uh, to how uh, this uh, celebration, this annual celebration impacts the hearts of our conscious brethren from the indigenous community, um, also known as Native Americans, as uh, the commentator in the video noted, among other things, we have to get our origin story straight. And so I wanna to conclude today's broadcast, uh, what, uh, three days after um, uh, this national celebration with uh, some food for thought. This comes from uh, a piece of thought-provoking commentary titled The Real Story of Thanksgiving by Susan Bates. Most of us associate the holiday with happy pilgrims and Indians sitting down to a big feast. And that did happen once. The story began in 1614 when a band of English explorers sailed home to England with a ship full of Patuxic Indians bound for slavery. They left behind smallpox, which virtually wiped out those who had escaped. By the time the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts Bay, they found only one living Patuxic Indian, a man named Squanto, who had survived slavery in England and knew their language. He taught them to grow corn and to fish and negotiated a peace treaty between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag Nation or the Wampanoag Nation. At the end of their first year, the pilgrims held a great feast honoring Squanto and the Wampanoags. But as word spread in England about the paradise to be found in the new world, religious zealots called Puritans began arriving by the boatload, finding no fences around the land, finding no fences around the land. They considered it to be the public domain. Joined by other British settlers, they seized land, capturing strong young natives for slaves and killing the rest. But the Pequot nation had not agreed to the peace treaty Squanto had negotiated and they fought back. The Pequot War, was one of the bloodiest Indian wars ever fought. In 1637, near present day Groton, Connecticut, over 700 men, women, and children of the Pequot tribe had gathered for their annual green corn festival, which is our Thanksgiving celebration. In the pre-dawn hours, the sleeping Indians were surrounded by English and Dutch mercenaries who ordered them to come outside. Those who came out were shot or clubbed to death while the terrified women and children who huddled inside the longhouse were burned alive. The next day, the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony declared a day of thanksgiving 
because 700 unarmed men, women, and children had been murdered. Cheered by their victory, the brave colonists and their Indian allies attacked village after village. Women and children, over 14, were sold into slavery while the rest were murdered. Boats loaded with as many as 500 slaves regularly left the ports of New England. Bounties were paid for Indian scalps to encourage as many deaths as possible. Following an especially successful raid against the Pequot in what is now Stamford, Connecticut, the churches announced a second day of Thanksgiving to celebrate victory over the heathen savages. During the feasting, the hacked off heads of natives were kicked through the streets like soccer balls. Even the friendly Wampanoag did not escape the madness. Their chief was beheaded and his head impaled on a pole in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where it remained on display for 24 years. The killings became more and more frenzied with days of Thanksgiving feasts being held after each successful massacre. George Washington finally suggested that only one day of Thanksgiving uh, per year be set aside instead of celebrating each and every massacre. Later, Abraham Lincoln decreed Thanksgiving Day to be a legal national holiday during the Civil War. On the same day, he ordered troops to march against the starving Sioux in Minnesota. This story doesn't have quite the same fuzzy feelings associated with it as the one where the Indians and pilgrims are all sitting down together at the big feast. But we need to learn our true history so it won't ever be repeated. Next Thanksgiving, when you gather your loved ones to thank God for all your blessings, think about those people who only wanted to live their lives and raise their families. They also took time out to say thank you to the Creator for all their blessings. And with that, I close in our traditional way of closing with Surah Asr from the Noble Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr. Inna al insana lafi kusr. Illa ladina amanu wa amalu salihati. What the wasso bil hawk. What the wasso bis sabr. Which means, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, by the token of time through the ages, verily humanity is in loss, except those who believe and do good, and exhort one another to truth, and exhort one another to patiently persevere. Peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum.